um, the work that I'll discuss today could be applied to both situations. All right. So first, I'm um, just briefly what I mean by different types of uncertainty would be pretty basic, but just to kind of establish the vocabulary I'm going to be using. So um, when I say risk, I'm talking about uncertainty due to sort of inherent variability and probabilistic outcomes and ambiguity, um, meaning a, a type of uncertainty in addition to that risk, in addition to probability, um, often about probabilities themselves. So um, risk results from things like variability um, and has, it goes by many names, aleatory uncertainty, randomness, um, and ambiguity is what in psychology um, people call epistemic uncertainty or so maybe called imprecision or incertitude. So that's sort of what I mean by these different terms. So risk coming from things like spatial variation, individual differences, um, things like that, and ambiguity coming from maybe low sample size used to calculate risk, periodic observations, um, imprecise measurements, things like that. So ambiguity is referring to this type of uncertainty that can be reduced through empirical means. That if you had more data or you had better data collection, that that type of uncertainty would be reduced, whereas risk is sort of the inherent probabilistic nature of, of certain outcomes. Okay, any questions? I should say also, I, I don't know how you'd normally handle questions, but um, feel free to just unmute your mic and talk if you do want to ask a question. All right, so we'll start with probability distortion. So probability distortion is a key component of prospect theory, um, and it describes how people distort the probabilities that they're given when making a decision. So specifically, people tend to overweight small probabilities or act like they're larger than what they were said to be, and underweight large probabilities or act like they're smaller than what they were said to be. Um, and people are relatively insensitive to changes in moderate probabilities. Okay, so um, the probability weighting function describes this, and it would be the, the red line here. So as you can see, um, if I told you the probability of something is 0.25, this, oops, sorry about that, this function is saying that you would treat it more like um, 0.3 or something like that. So the red line would be the weighted probability, or you could call it subjective probability. Um, and um, the x-axis is the probability that I told you. So as you can see, they're sort of regressive with respect to the, the nominal probability, meaning the probability that was stated. So this seems irrational or suboptimal to not represent probabilities um, as they were, they were said to be and violates axioms of probability theory and consistent with um, expected utility theory and just seems sort of generally problematic. Um, but there are some exceptions. So when people are making decisions in areas that they have a lot of expertise, um, they don't exhibit as much probability distortion, more sensitive to changes in moderate probabilities, um, and can even be not, not only linear, but can even be exactly um, matched with the nominal probabilities, so no distortion. So some examples that have been noted in the literature are racetrack bettors and options traders, so people that are dealing with these risks all the time and show less probability distortion than, than other people would who don't normally deal with these risks. So some of the existing explanations for probability distortion, um, the first coming from common controversy themselves is um, diminishing sensitivity. And this is basically the idea that probabilities of zero and one are reference points. And that as you move away from zero and one, you have a diminishing sensitivity to changes in probability. Um, another explanation that's been proposed is that it's, it's just basically a, a psychophysical limitation of um, how we represent probability and that it kind of stems from um, a perceived waiting time for probabilistic rewards. So basically um, Takahashi sort of derived the probability waiting function from um, what would be the waiting time for getting rewards of different probabilities. Another explanation is that this comes from um, place of emotion 
and basically that small probabilities will cause um, uh, an unexpected surprise because you didn't expect the outcome, but when you do get it, um, it has more emotional valence because it was unexpected. And um, that large probabilities will cause disappointment because since it's a large probability, you expected to get the outcome, but when you didn't, you were disappointed because it went against your expectations. So these are some of the existing explanations that have been proposed in the literature for this um, phenomenon, probability distortion. Um, others have suggested that it is due to uncertainty, um, like we're going to suggest, and uh, specifically that people use um, Bayesian priors, um, particular priors, and apply that to situations where they're confronted with probabilities and that that leads to the type of distortion that we see. So what we've proposed is that um, the reason that people distort probabilities is because probabilities have some inherent ambiguity or uncertainty. So if people see um, perceived stated probabilities, the probabilities that they are given as approximate or imprecise, then there would be two types of uncertainty. Um, there's the probabilities themselves and um, the sort of implicit imprecision associated with those. So if I tell you um, the chance of this outcome happening is there's a 20% there's probability of this outcome happening, um, that you assume I gathered that information from some sort of sampling procedure, some sort of estimation that is inherently imperfect, that that's not, um, you know, that's not a perfectly precise parameter, that's an estimate that I came up with from sampling. And if so, um, decision makers may actually be warranted in distorting probabilities. So it may not be irrational or mysterious, it may be um, a pretty sophisticated response to um, this imprecision associated with the probabilities that they're given. Um, and the reason that we think this is happening is because likelihood functions are biased. So if I give you um, a sample, a probability from a sample, so I take, you know, 100, a sample of 100 from a distribution and I get 20% hits, 20 out of 100. Um, you can estimate the likelihood of any probability that that distribution actually had based on the sample that you got. And imprecise or small samples result in more biased likelihood functions um, where if you think of the likelihood function like a distribution, the mean of it is closer to 0.5 than the MLE, than the, what would be the mode of the likelihood function. So I'll go in more detail on this in a second. Um, and large samples result in um, relatively unbiased likelihood functions, okay, where the, the mean, quote unquote, and, and the maximum likelihood are similar. So for example, if I, these are the same proportion Right, so if I take two samples, um, on the left, the maximum likelihood is here, and um, what would be like the mean, if you think of this as a distribution, is closer to 0.5. But the larger that sample gets, so if now I have 100 instead of 20 as my sample size, um, the narrower the likelihood function gets, and the MLE is similar to any other sort of measure of central tendency for this function. And as we approach um, probabilities of 0.5, we get a more symmetric function. So um, this is consistent with this probability weighting function because at 0.5, we're undistorted, where a, a nominal probability of 0.5 equals a weighted probability of 0.5. Um, and small probabilities are overweighted and large probabilities are underweighted. Does anybody have any questions at this point? So is, is this assuming that the individual this is being communicated to is somehow implicitly aware of the sample size? Um, that's, where the, that's where they're accounting for this uncertainty? Um, basically, we would expect that if they were told the sample size was large or the sample size was small, that that would affect their probability distortion. And that's some of the behavioral data that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but I think that even if they weren't explicitly told a sample size, 
that they assume that it's at least imperfect, right? That it's at least from a sample, which is always going to be, you don't have some chance of being imprecise. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the idea is that if, you know, we, we told them it was a, you know, a sample of a million, that their weighted probabilities would almost match this black undistorted line. And then if we told them the sample was, you know, four, that we'd see an even more regressive probability weighting function that had even, um, you know, a, had, was closer to being um, like horizontal. So what we wanted to do is um, demonstrate this using a model that, um, that distorting probabilities can actually be advantageous if your probability information is imperfect, right? Because in the literature, you know, we give people probabilities and then we see what they do and we look at their decisions and we say, okay, well, they're not representing it, right? I said it was 0.25, but they're acting like it's higher than 0.25. Um, what's wrong with them? But um, what we wanted to demonstrate here is that if the probabilities are imprecise, it actually is advantageous to do that. And you're actually correcting for some biases in how um, probabilities are estimated. So we created an agent-based model where agents made choices between two rewards and every reward had a probability and a value. Um, so for example, an agent might be presented with this option, um, Point, uh, a 50% chance of $100 or a 75% um, chance of $80. And then instead of giving them these actual numbers, we estimated the probabilities basically. So we would sample from, and in this example, it's a sample size of 10, we would sample from a distribution that has the, that true probability, but what the agents receive is the sample proportion. So here the probability is 0.5. We sampled, uh, we took 10, a sample size of 10, and we got four out of 10. So to the agent, the probability is 0.4, right? And then for um, a probability of um, a 75, we would sample from that as well. And let's say we got nine out of 10 from that distribution. So to the agent, this is these are the probabilities. And this is supposed to be analogous to you know real world decision making where any probability that, that we are given to make a decision is the result of some kind of sample right or some kind of estimation procedure we don't have all the true probabilities of everything available to us all the time it's usually based on experience or or some kind of information we were given from others so then the agents presented with this information and they weighed it according to their probability weighting function so here it's shown as linear the the examples i showed were curve Generally in the literature, um, the probability weighting functions are, are curved, but um, here I used a linear one for simplicity. We've done this model with both curved and linear and it, it is the same result either way. I can talk more about that later if people are curious about that um, detail. But basically what we're getting at is why are probabilities regressive? Um, the exact shape of the weighting function is difficult to say exactly and varies um, but the, the consistent finding in probability distortion is that probabilities, weighted probabilities are regressive with respect to nominal probabilities. So that's what's represented here. So this agent is told, okay, there's a, um, this probability is 40% and 90% and they weight it according to their weighting function and they overweight this smaller probability a little bit and they underweight this larger probability a little bit and the agents vary in the parameter that determines how um, steep this is, their function. So how regressive their weighted probabilities are with respect to the nominal probabilities. Okay. And then they use their weighted probabilities to pick the option with the highest expected value. And then they receive the actual expected value based on the true probability which is not what they were given. So this is sort of supposed to simulate um, situations where you're given probability information that was derived from some sampling procedure and it's inherently imprecise and you make your best decision based on that information and then you receive the outcome that's the, the true outcome. Does anybody have any questions about that? All right, so like I said, the agents vary in their weighting parameter and we also um, 
varied the sample size used to calculate the probabilities, to estimate the probabilities for the agents. So we had a range of sample sizes here on the x-axis, and, and we looked at um, the average weighting parameter of the last generation. So we, these agents were allowed to evolve and um, find the optimal weighting parameter. So weighting parameters of one are, are undistorted. Those, the, weight, the weighted probability will equal the nominal probability. And as the weighting parameter gets lower, you get a more regressive function. So more, more distortion. So as we can see, um, when we have a large sample, you know, that would be very precise. The optimal weighting parameter is, is near one, meaning that when there's a large sample used to estimate probabilities, you should not distort that information, which makes sense because you're getting good information and you want to use that information to make your decision. But with the smaller sample sizes, we see that the lower weighting parameters are optimal. And that's because those probabilities that are estimated from small samples are imprecise. So correcting for that by weighting those probabilities is advantageous in those environments. And I'll go a little bit more into why exactly that's the case. But does anybody have any questions at this point? I have a question. It looks yeah. like there's samples at, at, at sample size. What is that, that first group on the left? It's not one, it's not four. It's two. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't look like it's lining up at two. Maybe I'm... Oh, well, maybe I am um, offset a little bit. But we did, I think we did, um, yeah, it was like two, four, eight, sixteen, so... Oh, okay. So exponents yeah. are two, basically. Oh, it's a log scale. Log scale. Yeah. Um, maybe it is. Yeah, probably is. Thanks. Yeah, this, this is log scaled on the bottom. All right. So what did we learn from these simulations or, or demonstrate, I should say, because um, it's sort of the expected outcome. But um, distortion is advantageous under ambiguity and um, specifically overweighting small probabilities and underweighting large probabilities is advantageous. Um, weighting parameters above one are um, progressive with respect to nominal probabilities. They're steeper than the nominal probabilities, and those are never advantageous in the, in the environments we simulated. And um, we did this with nonlinear agents as well. There's a few models out there for nonlinear weighting functions, and we use those as well, but you get the same results. And basically, um, this, is a, this is a very ecologically plausible explanation because, like I said, probability information usually results from some kind of sampling procedure and um, small unre unrepresentative samples are everywhere. And even when we are provided with um, relatively precise probabilities from literature or something or some kind of model, they're never perfect. And we know that people are sensitive to ambiguity. Um, there's plenty of research on this in judgment decision making about how people respond to ambiguity or uncertainty about probabilities. Um, there's even some data from fMRI that shows that um, risk and ambiguity are processed separately by people. So ambiguity is not considered um, an extension of risk or, or extreme risk. It's considered another type of uncertainty. And you can actually um, find people who have lesions that um, cause them to be insensitive to ambiguity specifically and not risk. Okay, so if, um, if the reason that distorting probabilities has to do with this um, likelihood function explanation that I went through before, um, we should be able to select for agents that, uh, that use the maximum likelihood instead of something like the mean, if you think of this as a distribution. So we should be able to create environments where distorting probabilities is not advantageous. So what we did is we um, kind of replicated our previous simulations, but with different um, rules for how the agents are rewarded. 
So we wanted to create environments where um, using the maximum likelihood, what I have marked as the mode, would be the best thing to do, um, and the median and the mean of the likelihood function. So the, the choice data that I um, presented before is still here, these little gray lines. Um, oh, this is a little hard to see. The mode is the purple, median is orange, and mean is green. So the mode simulations involve rewarding agents for um, estimating the probability uh, exactly. So when I showed before how the agents receive their, um, the probability that we tell them and then they weight it with their own personal probability weighting function, um, here we were rewarding the agents if their weighted probability equaled the true probability. Okay, and as you can see, um, those agents always did best if they didn't distort probabilities. So the optimal weighting parameter was always one, even in very ambiguous or imprecise environments. So distorting was not advantageous in that situation. So that kind of gets to um, why distortion is advantageous in other situations. So in most situations, we are not trying to have um, the most trials where we guess something exactly. We're trying to reduce our error on average. So when we're making choice, risky choices, like in the choice model I showed before, um, the idea is that we'll do best if we um, reduce our average, sort of average error when estimating probabilities and that will lead to the best choices. So that's in contrast to a situation where you're rewarded for guessing something exactly, right? So if, if you're only rewarded for matching the true probability exactly, you should not distort probabilities because um, that is analogous to using the maximum likelihood every time. And the maximum likelihood is the most likely probability, obviously. Okay, and um, for the median simulations, um, they were rewarded for reducing their deviation from the probability, the true probability and for mean for reducing squared deviations from the true probability. So these rules are, these rules favor using the various like me, median, mean mode. And then the choice data is the same data that I showed before. Um, so as you can see, only the mode does best when undistorted. And um, we also match this up with Laplace's rule of succession which was proposed to um, be helpful in situations where samples are small, and that actually matches up exactly with the choice and um, the mean simulations. So as you can see, the choice simulations I showed before line up with the mean simulations, showing that those agents did best when they were um, reducing deviation from the true probability. So um, the point of this is basically that Depending on the situation and the type of decision that you're making, different, um, different methods of dealing with uncertainty are best, right? As you all know very well. Um, so when we evaluate behavior and we say, okay, these people are distorting probabilities, that must be a limitation, that must be something that's wrong with people, that they can't represent probabilities accurately we have to think a little more about, well, what's their goal in the situation? And what we're arguing here is that they are achieving their goal because their goal, they're not using the MLE, and that's why we, they look like they're being irrational, but the MLE is not best in that situation. So they're using something that better achieves their goal because how you deal with uncertainty and how you incorporate that into weighting your risk estimate is going to determine how well you do based on the, the environment that you're in. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Okay, um, now I'm gonna talk about base rate and neglect. Um, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and then we'll kind of come back to probability distortion. So quick base rate example, um, you are all well aware of how base rates work, but um, just to kind of establish vocabulary again. So say we have um, 10,000 men who are getting tested for HIV. Um, and we have one man who has HIV and all the others don't, which is about the base rate of HIV in men. 
Um, the one with HIV will almost certainly get a positive test. Those tests are very accurate. And of the ones who don't, we'll probably get about one false positive. And because of this, um, the probability that the man actually has HIV, given he got a positive test, is um, only 50%, right? Because this is how base rates work. Because the base rate of HIV is so small that even though the test is very accurate and false positives are um, a small percentage of people who are tested, there's a lot of people who don't have HIV, so that small um, percent ends up being half of the people who actually got a positive test. So just an example um, to show in the, the problems I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes, this is what I'm referring to as base rate and um, individuating information is the sort of case specific information that's used to evaluate that particular individual. So in psychology, Oh, and I should say, this is the kind of thing you see a lot of, like the Giga Renzer work and things like that. This, that type of problem, like the mammogram problem and things like that. You've probably um, heard all about the behavioral experiments on how people deal with base rates in those situations. But in psychology, um, traditionally, base rate work is a little bit different in that we don't present people with all numerical information, but the individuating information tends to be um, verbal. So we would give a base rate, and this is a, the classic example from Kahneman, um, the lawyer engineer problem. So we'd say something like 30% of people in a sample are lawyers and 70% are engineers. And then we'd give, uh, we'd say we selected a person, we give a description of that person that makes it sound like they're a lawyer in some vague way, right? They're charismatic, they're performative, strategic, whatever. Um, some kind of stereotypes about that. And that's to suggest that this person is a lawyer. And then the participant has to say, what is the probability that he's a lawyer? And the idea is that they incorporate the base rate information with the individuating information. So individuating information is analogous to like the test in the HIV example, it's the case specific information. And the idea is that they incorporate these two things together and say, what's the probability he's a lawyer? And then there would be another condition where we would flip the base rate and we'd say 70% of people in the sample are lawyers and 30% are engineers, which is the opposite. But we'd give the same description and then ask again, what's the probability that this person is a lawyer? So the idea is that because the base rate changed so much, their answer to this question should be very different in this second scenario. But what we see or what has been claimed in the literature is that people don't change their answers between these two situations. And that that must mean they're only looking at the individuating information and not the base rate. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. So um, we have, there's these papers in the literature that say, okay, we switched the base rate, people gave pretty similar answers between the two, we would have expected a much bigger difference based on the difference in base rate. So what's going on, people must be ignoring the base rate. Um, what we're suggesting is that um, base rates are possibly um, subject to probability distortion, what I was talking about before. Um, we know that people distort probabilities in all kinds of contexts. And um, why wouldn't they distort base rates, which, which are probabilities? So if they are, so say I tell you, okay, the, the base rate in this situation is 10%, the base rate in this situation is 90%. Well, that's a pretty big difference. So if I flip those base rates and keep the same individuating information, you should give me a very different answer in the first versus the second scenario. However, if the base rates are distorted, and the small probabilities are overweighted and the large probabilities are underweighted. Um, that's a much smaller difference between base rates due to that distortion. So now if we see a smaller difference between scenario A and scenario B, then we would expect given the nominal base rates, maybe we shouldn't be that surprised because their subjective weighted probabilities are probably closer together than those nominal base rates. And that could be reducing the difference in the estimates they give between those two scenarios. Um, and probability distortion is never uh, accounted for in base rate neglect. Um, base rate neglect 
work usually doesn't apply any transformation to probabilities at all and assumes that people um, act as if the probabilities are exactly what you told them. So we wanted to test whether ambiguity had an effect on base rate neglect. So um, as I was talking about before, probability distortion should be more extreme when probabilities are ambiguous. And you should see less distortion when probabilities are precise. So we use base rate problems like the lawyer engineer um, problem from other studies, but we change the base rate information to describe it as very precise or very imprecise. Um, so for example, we'd say it's, you know, precise base rates are based on census data and um, scientific literature and some kind of formal records that could be perceived as very precise. And the ambiguous ones were based on um, informal estimates of probabilities from someone's memory or from some small sample or something like that. So we end up with um, this design where we have 1% base rates, 50% base rates. Um, there's a reason we use those probabilities. I can go into more detail if anybody's um, curious, but basically for methodological reasons. And we have our unambiguous ones and our ambiguous ones and a few different scenarios in each. Um, so what we should see is that, so this is a mean probability estimate. So the answer to the question, what's the probability this person is an engineer or whatever the question was in that scenario. And the base rates that accompanied that question. And we have our unambiguous and ambiguous base rates. So what we should see is that when base rates are unambiguous, when they're very precise, that they matter more. They have more of an effect on the estimate um, because they are presumably undistorted or relatively undistorted. And that when they're ambiguous, we should see more base rate neglect, quote unquote, that people are not using the base rates as much. And that is what we find. So we find that when the base rates are precise, they're much more influenced than um, when they're ambiguous. And also that that doesn't matter at 50%, which is also consistent with um, the probability weighting function that I showed before where um, probabilities of 50% are undistorted because if probability distortion moves probabilities towards 0.5, then when you're at 0.5, distortion doesn't have an effect. So this is pretty consistent with our previous proposal. Um, so we found, first of all, that base rates are not just entirely neglected, which is often claimed in literature. And that um, the similarity between estimates when um, base rate changes is likely due to perceived ambiguity and not just neglect of the base rate. So we wanted to replicate this with um, clinical domains, so medical decision-making and um, clinical psychology decision-making scenarios. So we kind of replicated this study, but changed the stimuli to speak to these clinical domains. So um, the, the base rate would be things like the prevalence of the disease and the individuating information would be things like test results, symptoms, the appearance of the patient, things like that. And we wanted to manipulate ambiguity in a couple different ways. Sample size is the first one, which is analogous to our simulations and um, sample relevance, which I'm not gonna talk about much today because um, it's a little, we're gonna run another study. The, the method makes it a little ambiguous what the results mean. Um, and it could be a whole talk of its own. So I'm gonna leave that one out for today. And this is important because um, there's a lot of work on base rates being neglected in medicine. So for mammogram base rate problems where physicians are presented with um, mammogram sensitivity and specificity and um, the base rate of breast cancer. Um, most physicians answer this wrong. Um, in the HIV test problem that I showed before, we also see really bad results with how um, healthcare providers um, do the math on these sorts of things. So it's a, it's a really um, a valuable area to look at these biases. Okay, so like I said, base rates the prevalence of the disease in that population and individuating information would be the case specific information about that patient. And um, the small samples were things like one clinic reported their records of 
of their patients versus something like a meta-analysis of all survey data on, on a certain um, disease or something like that. So we made it seem like um, some of these were, you know, small or unrepresentative samples and, and others were more reliable samples. Um, in this case, we expected the same thing that we found in the previous study where base rates mattered more when they were precise, but we didn't find that this time. Um, we didn't, I mean, it sort of looks like there's a slight interaction, but there's not. Um, the sample size used to calculate the base rate in this situation did not have an effect on if the, how, how much the base rate um, influenced the probability estimate. And this sample included a lot of experts, doctors, um, medical doctors, I should say, people in clinical psychology and psychiatry and things like that. I can talk more about this if anybody's curious, but I'll just move on for now. Um, so we did find that base rates do matter to them. They're not neglecting the base rate, but we found no evidence that providing more information to disambiguate base rates would help because that was the idea. You know, if, if they neglect base rates when the sample's lower, it seems imprecise, we can do something about that. We can make that base rate seem more precise. We can give them more information. Maybe we don't have access to a lot of information to disambiguate that base rate. Um, but we didn't find evidence for that. Um, we also did this with non-experts and we found the same results. Experts and non-experts didn't do anything different in these scenarios. Okay, now I'm gonna leave the last part of this um, up to Christian to talk about some of his data and then I'll jump back in for just a minute or two with some conclusions at the end. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for, for the uh, opportunity to talk to, to you all and thanks to uh, Kelly for letting me crash the, uh, the end of her, what is uh, really her presentation. So um, I just wanted to um, uh, sort of highlight this uh, because it's a cool work. It goes along with this kind of bundle of um, demonstrations that, uh, you know, uncertainty um, may help to explain some of these quirks of behavior. Um, and uh, because, uh, because Scott's in the audience and this was uh, all stuff that came from um, conversations with, with him. So, um, so uh, I'm also gonna uh, sort of, uh, unfortunately have to cue Kelly to, to flip slides. So, um, so loss of version, oh, I, I will also mention this is gonna be very brief because uh, I'm just sort of making this appearance, uh, hopefully um, augmenting the, this larger story um, with an, one additional piece of evidence and then sort of getting out of here. So, um, so loss aversion uh, is a behavioral uh, phenomenon um, in, in which uh, people are um, relatively unwilling to take uh, mixed gambles. And so if you go to the next slide, Kelly, the, um, the sort of standard demonstration is some variant of this, right? You offer people mixed gambles like this um, or something like this. Uh, so a 50-50 chance of winning or losing $50 you ask them whether uh, they would like to accept that gamble and play, flip the coin, uh, or if they would like to not do that. Uh, and so most people decline uh, these sorts of gambles, um, even though as I think on the next uh, sort of animation, yeah. So the expected value here um, is equivalent whether you uh, accept or decline. Um, and the general uh, explanation for this um, is, uh, has to do with the way that people in, interpret and represent uh, those values, the sort of monetary amounts on the left there. So if you go to the next slide, we have kind of a cartoon of a value function. This is a subjective value function on the x-axis here. We have um, sort of objective changes in welfare. So the fact that I just handed you um, $50 or the fact that you just handed me uh, $50. Um, would move you to the right or to the left uh, on this uh, plot, respectively. Uh, and then on the y-axis, we have sort of um, how you subjectively value those changes. Uh, and so um, this uh, is sort of if you were um, veridically representing those changes in wealth. Uh, so $50 feels like, uh, you know, the, it, an increase in $50 and losing $50 feels like a loss of $50. And so the standard uh, explanation, explanation uh, for a loss aversion uh, basically says that this isn't how uh, value works subjectively, um, that instead the loss portion uh, of this function is simply sort of depressed. So on the next slide, um, we sort of uh, animate that, right? There you go. Uh, loss aversion is explained. Um, 
So it's not much of an explanation. It's really more of a, a, a description. It's really sort of a, um, a re-description of the, the empirical phenomenon uh, in, in the first place. So, uh, so the, there was a, a graduate student who was working with Scott uh, and, and um, so he suggested that maybe we don't have to, this isn't sort of necessary. We don't have to do this. So if we go back to just our sort of um, linear veridical uh, representation uh, of value here. Um, this doesn't get us loss aversion, but what if people uh, were sort of trying to come up with subjective values for these changes uh, in wealth? And they were doing their best, but those, uh, those subjective evaluations were sort of inherently uncertain. Uh, if that were the case, then maybe the value function would look like something like this, but it would look like something on the next slide. There we go. Uh, so at this point, um, we have uncertainty in how to map any particular uh, change in our, our status, our, our wealth, um, to some sort of subjective you know, um, valuation thereof. So um, at the uh, sort of origin, we have the status quo. We have current, the current state of affairs. And so we're relatively certain about what that feels like, how we value that. Uh, but as we move further and further away from you know, the status quo, um, it may get harder and harder to figure out exactly how we, uh, how we value those potential new states. Uh, and so this is, this is an, uh, an interval valued uh, subjective value function. And so for any particular um, objective value, so I think we on the next slide have uh, an illustration. Yeah, so um, getting you know, $50 or $10 or whatever, um, that maps uh, subjectively speaking to some sort of interval or some sort of uncertain um, representation uh, in the subjective value space. Uh, so the difficulty with this, of course, is that at some point people need to make choices. You need to say, yes, I would like to just participate in that gamble, or you would like to say no. Um, and so we have to collapse uh, this uncertain representation explicitly or implicitly at some point because we need to get uh, a dichotomous you know, behavior uh, out of this. Um, and so that leaves some uh, flexibility in how uh, decision makers that would have a representation like this um, actually resolve that, that uncertainty. Um, one uh, suggestion is that uh, uh, a decision maker who thinks that you know, uh, nature is, is sort of uh, adversarial um, might uh, be conservative and assume that the actual subjective value that will be experienced uh, in any given uh, situation um, lies sort of at the bottom uh, of the, these intervals. Um, that's sort of a conservative or worst case um, um, approach. Um, and it, in the extreme, that decision maker is basically assuming um, that their subjective value function uh, is the bottom edge of this, uh, this interval valued function. So at that point, uh, that decision maker's uh, value function would sort of effectively look like what is on the next slide, which looks a lot like the sort of loss aversion um, you know, plot that I showed you a few slides ago. Um, so a worst case uh, uh, reasoner with an uncertain uh, representation of subjective values uh, might be expected to exhibit loss aversion. So um, that, was, uh, that was Jack's um, brilliant idea. Uh, and um, so I uh, thought this was intriguing and I sort of went off and um, there are a variety of predictions that come from this um, account, um, uh, many of which I, I'm going to completely ignore today. But one of them is that um, the more uncertain you are about these subjective value uh, transformations um, the, and assuming that you are in fact a worst case or a um, worse side of uh, you know sort of um, average uh, reasoner, uh, the more loss averse you should be. Uh, and so um, this is you know this is I think on the next slide I, I think I say th this is all uh, about sort of um, hidden variables, uncertainty that comes from, you know, we're not sure where, why is this decision maker unable to come up with more precise uh, representations of the, the subjective value, uh, who knows. And so the idea uh, was to tackle this empirically and to do something uh, as kind of a, 
uh, as I said, a first stab um, at this uh, and begin to just ask, does sort of uh, exogenous manipulations of uncertainty uh, modulate uh, measured loss aversion? So that was what we did uh, in, this, uh, in this particular study um, that I uh, am about to present. And so this is basically the task. Um, so uh, we basically do the coin flipping exercise that I uh, illustrated before. Um, on the left uh, is a, a potential loss that's in red. On the right is a potential gain. There is always a 50-50 um, coin that will be tossed to uh, determine whether or not you receive the outcome, the loss on the left, uh, or the outcome, the gain on the right. Uh, and you just have to simply say, yes, I would like to participate in this gamble flip the coin or no, I would like to decline it, don't bother to flip the coin, that is it. So uh, one trial might look like this, so a loss of uh, eight, uh, a gain of five, uh, another trial might look like what is on the next slide. Um, we um, varied the magnitude of the gains and the magnitude of the losses um, you know, quite a bit over the course of the task. Um, and the des full design I think is on the next slide. Uh, and you don't need to know um, about any of this stuff, um, but uh, I will call your attention to the fact that we had uh, gambles trials with positive expected values, those were the ones to the bottom and right, uh, and ones with negative expected values, those are the ones to the top and to the left, um, and those uh, zeros uh, on that diagonal indicate the gambles for which um, the expected value is zero, much like the coin uh, flips that I started with. Okay, so we gave people a bunch of these uh, choices. Uh, those were the certain choices. We then gave them the essentially the exact same choices, um, but we were annoying and we put these uh, little sort of um, curtains over these uh, value thermometers so that now the loss that uh, this decision maker uh, is facing is somewhere between five and nine, uh, but there's no further information about um, you know, sort of which of those potential values, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, uh, it actually is, and the same thing on the gain side. Um, so this is a, a case where the sort of the occluders, the, the shades are sort of in exactly the same position on the left and the right. Um, the next slide shows a slightly different uh, trial. So again, these were varied uh, all, all over. Um, and so we had uh, corresponding trials from that design matrix I showed you a couple slides ago um, for both the certain and the uncertain um, conditions. So um, there's a bunch of ways to look at this data. Um, this is just sort of one representation. This is in a certain condition, and I just wanted to show you this um, to show you that people are in fact loss averse when, um, when they can see the magnitude of the gains and losses uh, precisely. Um, you can see I've highlighted uh, on the diagonal there, the uh, gambles in which the expected value is zero, and people are less uh, you know, than 50% likely to take those gambles. That's at least consistent with loss aversion. Uh, in the next uh, slide, we have the uh, same results for the uncertain condition. And uh, I won't ask Kelly to do it, but if you flip back and forth really fast, you will see that people are less likely to take all of these gambles in the uncertain condition than they are in the certain condition. And again, there's a variety of ways to kind of summarize um, these results. Uh, and on the next slide, you will see one way to sort of do it. Um, we just estimate sort of a, a standard parameter to quantify loss aversion. And I've plotted um, sort of what the sort of cartoony uh, value function would look like in the certain condition. Um, we have the sort of losses uh, on the top and on the uncertain version, uh, we have the losses on the bottom. Um, the, the lambdas there, that quantifies um, sort of how the value of losing a dollar uh, compared to uh, the, the gain uh, of a dollar on the other side. So losing a dollar in the certain condition um, feels like losing a, a buck 24, right? Uh, and in an uncertain condition, uh, it feels like losing a uh, dollar uh, and 40 cents. Uh, the, uh, this design uh, had all subjects uh, making all choices. So all of these estimates are um, within subjects. And so each subject basically gave us uh, quite a, a consistent um, pattern. So um, yeah, so this is quite reliable, even if the magnitude it, you know, for this uh, plot doesn't necessarily seem overwhelming. So, um, so just to, to wrap up this sort of brief uh, chapter, um, the manipulations of uncertainty um, 
uh, did in fact uh, modulate the loss aversion as this account uh, suggests, and it's at least consistent with this account. Um, uh, there are many other predictions and many other ways to sort of uh, chase after this uh, particular theoretical account of loss aversion, but um, again, yet another example of uh, a behavioral quirk that as of right now doesn't have a tremendous amount of sort of uh, mechanistic uh, explanation, um, but possibly um, due to something related to, to uncertainty. So, so I will let Killing take back over. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, so just briefly, some conclusions about all of this and, and where um, it might matter. Like I said, I'm doing a lot of work in medical decision aids. Um, so historically, there's a lack of recognition of this sort of ambiguity, this type of uncertainty um, in research on judgment and decision making. That's not to say there's none. There's theories that are solely about ambiguity, but um, there are a lot of phenomena that have been identified and sort of historically seen as mysterious that aren't when you account for uncertainty. And this has implications for decision making um, and in my area in medical decision aids. So this is one example of, if not mine, but um, some information that was included in a medical decision aid. And you can see like how many places it would sort of matter how people interpret probabilities. So we have a lot of base rate stuff going on, false positives, um, misses, things like that. And um, in any 100 men, is that meaningful, right? Obviously here, they just mean it as an example to make a pictogram of probability, but the sample size used to derive the probabilities themselves um, might be meaningful to people. Um, this is another decision aid from one of our collaborators. Um, where they're presenting some risk estimates for adverse events. And these are general, these aren't personalized. Um, and then there's sort of a, an attempt to account for certainty or ambiguity in some of these. Um, so you see out of 294 patients, out of 516, this is kind of analogous to the sample size issue I talked about before, is that going to affect if this probability is distorted or taken at face value or um, anything like that. So you can just see how, you know, it's important to understand how people respond to probabilities and how some implied certainty about them would matter. Because generally in these aids, a lot of things are just presented as probabilities and the, the sort of four out of 10 thing is used a lot or 40 out of 100 or whatever, these sort of pictograms and things like that, that don't really account for another layer of uncertainty, this epistemic uncertainty. Um, so it's important to, to sort of learn how to best present probabilities. Um, this is another example. Four out of 10 patients will have bleeding and you are one of them. We don't know why, um, at least from this pictogram. So not to say there's necessarily something wrong with these, but you can see where it'd be important to understand if um, certain things make a difference. How, ma how many people are, are represented by this little cartoon population and things like that. Um, obviously in medicine, personalized predictions are, are the big thing right now, right? This is what we do at Cornell. We have models that make um, estimates for how likely is it that you're gonna have, I work with LVADs, left ventricular assist devices. So if you get an LVAD, how likely is it that you're gonna have right heart failure, or you're gonna have bleeding, or you're gonna have stroke or something like that? And um, how long do we expect you to survive? We give personalized risk estimates to patients and physicians. Um, but how do we know, you know exactly how these estimates are being interpreted and if they're being weighted and things like that? Um, and how do we present the uncertainty associated with these estimates? So this is, this is always hard when you have models, you, when you're doing machine learning and stuff like that, and you're giving them um, their estimates, what is the best way to express uncertainty with that? If I say we expect you to survive one year, if you get an LVAD, what is the best way? There's, there's infinite ways that you can conceptualize uncertainty about that estimate, but it's um, easier said than done to sort of actually do that and know if the uncertainty is being appropriately um, applied to the decision. 
So lots of examples in public health and things like that too. There's some famous scandals with advertising campaigns that were a little misleading. Um, birth control pill scares happened two or three times now and has been devastating every time to a lot of people where uncertainty was um, misinterpreted and um, people changed their their course of action with their health care and there were some bad consequences with that. So just to kind of point out these sort of public health and uh, almost political implications of these things too. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute for Christian or I. Hi, good afternoon. Um, yeah, I'd just like to, if there's no one else who's wanting to ask, I'll probably start the ball rolling. Um, okay, yeah, basically, thank you so much for your insightful discussion on today's topic, and I really uh, enjoyed uh, today's discussion. And um, my question is um, directed for Kelly, Professor Kelly. So um, it's regarding the, the area of probability distortion. And if we could go back to the slide earlier that um, whereby we were doing uh, this, a um, binomial distribution, to uh, do this, um, that this uh, reweighting of the probability. Yep, this is the one. Uh, may I ask? Uh, I probably have uh, missed this earlier, but um, was is there a rationale behind? Uh, what's the rationale behind choosing binomial specifically? Or we could actually use other distributions to, you know, to do this kind of like, um, like, rescaling of the probability. Yeah, um, you could use other distributions. I'd have to think about you know, what exactly the implications of that would be, but it's not, uh, you know, you can imagine different distributions being used. It's basically just a placeholder for adding some uncertainty to this probability. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, I'm sure other, prob uh, other distributions could be used and we'd have to kind of rethink the expected results, but um, yeah, I don't, Christian, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I, I guess it would sort of depend. I, I guess you could sort of go in and kind of um, uh, antagonistically choose uh, sort of noise distributions that would somehow upend this general story. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, it was a, a matter of convenience since all of this uh, simulation stuff uh, was really kind of for illustrative purposes. Uh, if you hand me a precise uh, sort of point estimate of a probability and ask me to crank out, ge you know, generate data. This is obviously the first pass. So mm -hmm. do you have alternative suggestions? Uh, I was actually thinking uh, maybe the beta distribution uh, might be a good, uh, because it's, it has support between zero to one. But of course, uh, that begets a question, like what are we going to use for the shape parameters of the beta distribution? Because it really depends on what kind of data do we have and how can we characterize and the uncertainty with the uh, probability. So that was actually why I thought like, like beta, yes, but what are we going to use for the shape parameters? So because I wasn't really certain like well, what was the rationale behind binomial because I, like, I, I thought the beta might be a better choice. However, um, yeah, so I'm not sure exactly, um, like probably the binomial was used as a means of illustration in this case. So I, th I think the other way to think about this, it, it, because we, one of the things that um, Kelly mentioned was, you know, that there's been work about, um, you can get uh, sort of empirically realistic uh, patterns of um, distortion uh, mm -hmm. if you kind of handcraft priors in particular ways. Yep. Um, but if you start talking about uh, beta distributions, right, we're using the beta distribution, but we're using the beta distribution with sort of uh, flat priors. Yep. Uh, and if you once you start uh, moving away from that, then you need to start talking about sort of how the world works and how people kind of on average think the world works and what their priors are likely to be and whether they match, you know, how the world actually works. You know, so I think in, in some sense that would be kind of a general, a relatively straightforward generalization of this stuff, um, mm -hmm. but it gets more complicated because you have sort of more degrees of freedom. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I think too, if, if if you were particularly interested in an, an environment or some kind of sampling method where you expected probabilities to be like sort of systematically undersampled or oversampled or something like that, like you expected some reason that um, you were interested in that particular outcome, you could test something like that. But mm -hmm. without having a particular interest in something like that, um, seems like the most obvious. Right. All right. Yes, yeah, sorry. 
No, go ahead. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, actually, um, yeah, following on this, uh, what we just talked about, I, I actually had a second question. That is, like, is it possible that, uh, suppose we are given, like, a distribution, like, say, binomial for this case, and instead of, like, pinning a, a, a definite number on ambiguous probability, we could perhaps do, like, a, a sample of this ambiguous probability and perhaps from there construct an interval on the, on the weights by constructing, like, so-called a second-order distribution of the... Of the of the weights, I was wondering if that would uh, probably make sense as an extension to this uh, ambiguous probability uh, method. Um, so you're just to make sure I'm understanding. You're saying that the, the yeah. weighted probabilities themselves would have some uncertainty associated with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you you definitely could do something like that. There, there's obviously a lot of ways to represent that sort of thing, but. The issue becomes when it when you actually make a decision between these two choices, what do you use to come up with the agent's sort of expected value or how, how does the agent use that um, information to make a choice? At, at a certain point, you, I don't say you need a discrete number, but you sort of yeah. functionally end up using some kind of um, discrete estimate of that uncertainty because if you think about like, the sample itself, you could say, gives you like a likelihood function. That in and of itself is, is an uncertain sort of representation of the probability. But you, based on your decisions, you sort of functionally end up using some kind of m metric that represents that in a more discrete way. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but if you have a sort of uncertain weighted probability, what do you do? How do you combine that with the reward in order to make a choice? Yeah, because I was thinking like probably an interval analysis would would, uh, would be good because it like with the bounds, it can probably like tell you the degree of confidence I have over like certain decisions from that. And it was just something that just came to mind like impromptu. So I wasn't sure if that uh, that approach would probably make sense if we have an interval on the weights and the interval uh, on the uh, an approximated ambiguous probability. Yeah. I, I yeah, think, there's not... uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. I, I was gonna say, I, I think that makes sense from a sort of um, prescriptive standpoint um, mm -hmm. of like how, if you were one of these agents and, and you knew a lot about uncertainty and you were trying to kind of advise one of these agents mm -hmm. or a decision maker in a similar situation, like what maybe should you do? This is probably not it, right? Like that green line right there. Okay. Um, but I think, uh, I think the, the problem that we face um, given that we're trying to learn things about uh, you know, kind of ordinary decision makers is, uh, as Kelly said, at the end, and like I briefly mentioned for the loss of vision stuff, at the end, you have a choice, right? One thing was done and the other things were not done. And, uh, and so, you know, you can take one of these uh, complicated, involved situations, right? You're, con you're consulting with um, some sort of engineering team or economic team and you're uh, propagating all your uncertainty, uh, you're, you're constructing loss functions, and you're, you know, you're doing everything right. And then at the end, you sort of enact some policy, or you make a decision, or you, you know, whatever. Um, if you come from the outside as an external observer, and you ask, you, you say like, oh, that person made a choice, um, what uh, point estimate uh, is most consistent with that choice, or the series of choices, or whatever? Right. Um, there's an answer to that question. And that is typically kind of the perspective taken in these sort of empirical situations is kind of working backwards. Uh, and so you can, you can ha carry around as much uncertainty for as long as you want, but at the end, it all goes away in one way or another. And so from the outside, it's very difficult to actually figure out how much uncertainty uh, was carried for how long, what it looked like, et cetera because you're sort of squeezing all of these very nice, rich, you know, robust representations down into, I'm picking that. Right. Uh, so so I, I think it makes sense to sort of uh, think about this from the sort of decision makers uh, perspective. Like, do I want to carry on an interval? And it also makes sense to think about this from like the external observers perspective, um, mm -hmm. who has a much harder job. Sure. Yeah, I should, in case I didn't make it clear, this is in, in no way sort of prescriptive or normative or anything like that. It, it's basically to demonstrate that this thing that people do, weighting probabilities, that everybody acted like was so um, 
bad and, and, and mysterious and everything as far as a decision making strategy actually does work out in certain situations. Um, so it's not that this is the best way to do it. It's that based on the models that exist, these probability weighting functions, if we kind of apply them to situations where there is uncertainty about probability, they actually are advantageous. What's the difference between that and making a normative statement? I mean, your agent-based model says that they do better if they make this distortion, doesn't it? Yeah, they do better if they make distortion, but it's that it's sort of in the context of the probability weighting functions that we allowed them to have. Like there could be some totally other strategy that is the best possible thing that they could do. But when we allowed them to evolve in this space of probability distortion from undistorted to com completely um, like every probability is 0.5, this is what we found, you know what I mean? But they could do something completely different that could be better, you know, theoretically, there's, there's always a, a better option, but um, we were comparing not distorting probabilities to distorting probabilities, but not like some other option where they carry over some other type of uncertainty or something like that. Mm. Uh, Alex has his hand up. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I've been like biting me, uh... I'm late waiting to weigh in just because like, this uh, relates to a question I was thinking about. Uh, there was a, a statement early on um, talking about the fact that this distortion occurs in a response to a point value estimate because the person who is being communicated to is aware that there is uncertainty that isn't being accounted for in this point estimate. Uh, and that's why the weighting occurs. But uh, first thought was if you do present some uncertainty like an interval estimate to that individual how does that like are they then more likely to take that as a true representation of uncertainty or will they then apply their own additional layer of uncertainty some uh, their own assumption of uncertainty over the top of the uncertainty you've already proposed to them yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think if I know of any behavioral work that speaks to that that exact scenario where you pre present an interval. I, I don't think I know of anything that does that, um, but it's a good question. Like if, if we did present them with uh, an interval that was sort of bounded where we thought was accurate, would they also assume that each end of the interval is, is uncertain as mm -hmm. well? Um, I don't really know. I would assume that they would, ass that they would Think there was some uncertainty associated with that interval um, because even a, an interval is hard to get and, and define and where, where do you choose the beginning and end of that but um, but I don't know exactly. I know it's um, it's a thought I've been discussing with uh, I mean my, my, my partners in anesthetist and we'll be talking about um, communication in perioperative medicine and we just raised like the notion of if you but like it's it's just a kind of a thought. But if you were to communicate the the risks of a procedure to a patient in an interval, you can communicate the fact that yeah yeah. You we can't give you a point estimate because there's all sorts of factors that are unique to you that there is no model that can take all that into account. However, there is this interval, and at the moment, based on you, we think you could be at the higher end of the interval if you take these behaviors in the run-up to the operation you could move yourself towards the lower end of the interval and just wondering if that could be a useful tool for communication in a medical setting but it, it, is, it is all dependent on how much they trust those interval bounds yeah i i mean i think that's a really good point um i do think that the interval is in almost every case better than a point estimate because it does express some uncertainty and I think that that's valuable. Um, one of our collaborators does work with this as well. They have risk scores and you can have some, it's some sort of arbitrary range that you can be on this scale, your risk score, and they have sort of all the factors that you can do to bring yourself down on the risk score and get in like a better place for your prognosis and mm. you know be be things like um get to a point where you can walk for three miles or something like that um 
and bring yourself down. And I, I do think those things are really useful. I think anything where there's a sort of honest attempt to express the uncertainty is better than just point estimates because there's always uncertainty. And um, I think that it, it does help the decision-making process because they should account for it. Um, point estimates aren't enough when they make these decisions. So yeah, I do, I do think it's helpful. Yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to see how attempting to communicate uncertainty in the first place affects the, uh, the kind of weighting of the individual. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's hardest in my experience with um, presenting to the physicians because the patients, you're sort of limited in how much information you can give them mm. anyway, so you end up with these sort of simplified things, but with the physicians, we're presenting the results of models for all these different adverse events and um, survival uh, estimates, hospital stay, things like that. And, um, you know, they sort of, they have access to all these variables. They sort of have the capacity to um, wrap their head around all these things. So the, the potential to, for these decision aids to grow and have all these different risk estimates is, is higher. And it's hard to present, um, you know, if you have a, an estimate from a model, what is the best way to express the uncertainty about that? It's so much harder to do than you would think. Mm. It's not rhetorical, by the way. If anybody has any ideas, please let me know. <laughs> Can I interject? I, I think that you actually offer the idea. You, Kelly, I, you're constantly underselling yourself because, I mean, although it's true that when you first talked about people being given probabilities, uh, you noted that people are implicitly acting as though there's a sample underneath. Um, but in the agent-based stuff, uh, you did exactly express that epistemic uncertainty in the sample, right? In the smallness or largeness of the sample. It seems to me that that's what you've done, don't you think? And and, and simulation. Uh, yeah, and, and and that's by the way a a possible uh, avenue of expressing the same stuff to those decision makers too. You don't have to do those; just use the sampling results of an appropriately sized sample, you know, appropriately sized meaning to, so that it characterizes the uncertainty that you actually have. Well, was, was the response to sample sizes for weighting not that it doesn't really affect the weighting function for actual decision makers? In the medical context? Yeah. Um, yeah, that was the result. And so we found that sample oh precision did work in general, but when we moved into the medical domain, it didn't work. And there's a few reasons that that could happen. Um, obviously, a variety of task related methodological things, but also that we just didn't manipulate sample size in the range where it matters. Like we were, you know, all our samples were too big or too small, and we were having some floor or ceiling effects or something like that. But we, they were like everything from a uh, hundred patients from one clinic, 100 is the lowest you can go to get a base rate of one, of course, um, and up to like tens of thousands from national uh, and like worldwide survey and real surveys and stuff like that. So it seems like it should have mattered like 100 versus a, a meta-analysis of, of, you know, some scientific literature that should make a difference to a physician Obviously, there's other things to account for. Did they already have an idea of what the base rate was, so it doesn't matter what we said and things like that. But um, yeah, we didn't we didn't find that it mattered there, so that's hard. And and also, if it's just you know how many people out of this sample had this given disease or something like that, you can just give the sample size to um, express uncertainty. But if you're dealing with predictions from a model, the sample size used to you know, train or test that model is not, that's not what you need. You know, you need like based on the variables that this patient, that we have observed for this patient or the specific values of those variables, how does that affect how confident we are in our prediction and things like that. So it gets pretty complicated pretty fast. Mm. Can, can I ask Scott, because I, I always liked the, the, you know, the equivalent binomial count as a representation, but the, Kelly's um, points uh, both because of empirical sample sizes and because of non-sampling related uncertainty. Um, do you have recommendations? So, so if I go to a doctor and I say, um, you know, the, the probability of some, this patient having some condition or an arbitrary patient having some condition is 
that you should think about it as if it's one out of four or something, right? So 25%, but very uncertain. Um, the, the, the sort of as if part is really critical because uh, in the real world, a doctor or an engineer or an economist might say, but like, no, no, we have way more data than that. Why are you, why are you talking about samples of four? Um, it, have you thought about how to, to sort of communicate the like as if uh, stylized sort of nature of those uh, counts, those representations? Yeah, um, well, the, you mentioned the equivalent binomial count is, I mean, the idea is exactly uh, to answer that question that Kelly poses, which is, you know, there's more uncertainty in those simulations and those risk assessments than uh, than just from the sampling uncertainty, right? There's all kinds of, you, know, you didn't know what the correct model was, right? So you've projected all that uncertainty in your risk analysis, and now you have an answer. Maybe it's expressed as a P-box, or maybe it's expressed, you know, in some other way. Um, and so the idea behind that, that equivalent binomial count idea is that you match that result with its full flower of uncertainty uh, against uh, basically those uh, uh, binomial counts that express that level of uncertainty. Now, Kelly's right that, uh, I mean, actually, I, I wouldn't expect a big difference between a sample size of 100 and a sample size of 100,000, actually, because 100 is actually pretty big as a sample size. Um, and so there might not be a big difference there, but the differences, the big differences are like with smaller numbers, like one in four, right? One in 10 and one in 20. Um, and other than the problem of not being able to represent really small probabilities, um, I think that it makes sense to sort of make that translation to, you know, that that's basically it's that sampling size uh, that's implicit in your agent-based uh, simulation is how, how how small is the sample size how small would the sample size have to be to to get you to understand that level that that that, that level of uncertainty is is in our result I don't know if that yeah makes sense. I, I guess it's the the sort of communicative part of that like constructing them seems fine um, but handing someone a, a a one out of four representation um, seems like you're opening yourself up for criticism that like we have more than four samples like why are you handing this to me it's false because um, we acknowledge that there's other uncertainties present yeah i, I just don't know how to communicate that to a, a sort of less sophisticated audience i guess in a way that would seem compelling i, th I guess that you know the the expression of you know odds sort of makes sense to a lot of people and one out of sort of makes sense to a lot of people. And, and we have those limited experiments that suggest that those actually do make sense to people, that they make the correct, you know, op op optimal decisions when they, when they have the information in that form. But the, the problem is, how do you do it when the ratios are so biased, when the, you know, it's a one in a million chance, um, and you've got massive uncertainty about that one in a million chance, it could be one in a hundred thousand, right? So how do you express such a small uncertainty with such a clumsy device like mm. odds ratio. Yeah. Is, is it possible, is it like there is another, there is a layer of uncertainty over the top, which I guess you're trying to account for with reducing the, like the denominator in the equivalent binomial count or the, like the sample size. But I'm, I'm thinking like in the context of like testing for COVID, it's like you might have a huge uh, number of tests being performed. So you've got an enormous sample size and you've got some sort of estimate of the, the prevalence of the disease or something across the whole population. If you're then using that, say like assuming someone like a teacher is at particularly high risk of contracting COVID, you might have a huge sample size you can draw on, but how do you reduce that to an appropriate representation of the uncertainty? Because this person is a teacher, they are presumably at much higher risk than the general population. If you don't specifically have the data for that, is it meaningful to, to give them the estimate based on the population as a whole? And how, how do you go about reducing that to 
bring in that additional layer of uncertainty that the EBC doesn't hold by itself? Yeah, this is precisely the question that the condition I didn't talk about was um, designed to answer. So when I was talking about the medical uh, base rate experiment and I said there's one condition that you know we're still trying to work out, um, what we tried to do there is instead of presenting small samples, we tried to present like quote unquote irrelevant base rates, not completely irrelevant, but um, base rates where uh, the population that was used to estimate the base rate differs from your case in some way. So in your example, you know, a teacher walks into my clinic and I have the base rate of COVID, but the base rate of COVID is primarily made up of non-teachers, right? Mm. So does that base rate apply? Is it useful in this situation? And this is where um, you, of course, get like a blending between like what's the base rate and what's the individuating information and, and things like that. Um, it, it's hard to work these things out because it's hard to manipulate, um, you know, the, the relevance of the base rate to that case without changing any kind of um, really diagnostic case specific information. Um, it's, it's hard to sort of keep those things from being confounded in an experiment, but it, I think that's a really interesting question. Like, or if, if I'm a doctor and somebody walks into my clinic and I have, um, you know, some knowledge of the base rate of um, sleep apnea or something, but this person is obese and has all these other risk factors that make mm. that more likely to have it. Like, do I use that base rate? Is that base rate actually going to be harmful in my decision making? Is it going to be, should I still use it, but like weight it in some way? And obviously there's a million ways to work this out normatively. There's a, a it's, it's not mysterious sort of how you should do that, but how to communicate those strategies to actual cl uh, clinicians and patients and stuff like that. That's the hard part. Mm. Why do you say it's not mysterious normatively? I mean, I'm not sure the Bayesians do know how to do that. <laughs> how, how do they... Yeah. I mean, if my reference class is wrong, if my base rate is wrong, how do I manipulate it with a, in the absence of data on the relevant population? How should I manipulate it? Yeah, I mean, in, in the absence of, of that data, maybe it is mysterious, but um, I just mean like there's, you can imagine strategies that would be best or something in those situations, but um, a lot of the problem is how to actually get people to do that. Right. Yeah. Are you, are you have your hand up, Christian? Or you're waving? You're muted. Yeah, he's waving. Goodbye. Okay, go teach. Thanks so oh. much. Okay. Well, thank, thank you so much, Professor Christian. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll thank let you. Kelly take thank over you. even more. Thanks, Christian. Okay, now let's talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> Back to business. So, can I ask you a question about your uh, presentation? Uh, back when you were talking about how when when you've rewarded for the getting the exact B, uh, doing on the mode rather than the medium, mm -hmm. um, you said that that was uh, a possible way where the you shouldn't di distort at all, right? The, the optimal strategy would not be. So my question is, uh, well, I was totally convinced by the other argument that said the mean was the thing to be looking at. So, and you said that was ecologically. Uh, plausible. So what's the ecologically plausible scenario in which I would be looking at the mean? Or, I'm sorry, the mode. The only thing I could think of was bombing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny you say that because every time we, we work on this or we write about this or something, we try to put these examples in and it's just so rare that you actually, it, whether it's probabilities or, or anything else that that you only benefit if you are exactly correct the most number of times, right? Versus reducing deviation on average. So it's so hard to come up with these examples. I think um, we talked about this with you and Lev years ago, and that, that was really the main example we talked about was like, um, you know, archery or like bombing or something like that, where unless you get oh, under right. certain rules, <laughs> gunplay horseshoes and hand grenades are, yeah. are not <laughs> gunplay is so is that is well but is that a legitimate uh, example then do you think bombing you know where you it only makes a difference if you actually hit the target 
Yeah, um, it doesn't matter how close you are. If you don't hit it, you get nothing. Right. And so in that case, maximum likelihood is what you should use. You shouldn't distort at all. Yes. And so that, and that's a real scenario. That's should that should exist, right? Because we do bomb a lot. Mm -hmm. At least days, right? Okay. Um, let's an, another question. You you argued that uh, the base rates aren't ignored or aren't neglected, but you really didn't argue that. What you're really arguing, it seems, was that the base rates aren't neglected entirely, because they do seem to be, you know, not paid their full measure of attention that the Bayesians would suggest they should be paid. Isn't that and, right? And the behavior. The behavior. Yeah. 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 When I say when I say not neglected, I mean they have a significant measurable effect on outcomes. Not that necessarily the um, you know Bayes rule was applied and they did the exact thing that they should do according to the Bayesians, but um, I just mean that like they had some effect on behavior because there's a lot of work like the giga render stuff and things like that that says just people don't use base rates because they see it as irrelevant to the problem. They see it as completely useless in that particular decision. Um, and that can happen, but that usually only happens when people are doing like a math problem. Like I give you sensitivity, specificity, and base rate, and you have to work out the math, and people can't do it because they flip the conditional probabilities and they get it all wrong. But um, as long as people aren't making a sort of mathematical error and they have maybe more um, uh, qualitative individuating information or something like that where they don't have to do explicit math, they usually do use the base rate in some way. Okay, so, so you're not saying, for instance, that some people are using it and some people aren't and the overall effect is that it looks like it's on average more, is closer, well, it's being neglected a little bit, if not entirely. It, but you're saying that everybody is doing it in the same way, at least for the same problem. And, Correct. Okay. And yeah, that we they are all the individual stuff to make sure we're not just getting some aggregate between people who use it and people who don't. But um, yeah, we but, do all uh, multi-level modeling and, and the subjects but, are, are random effects in there. But the effects or the, the, the magnitude of their use is always sub- uh, what the Bayesian say it should be, right? It's always in the direction of neglecting rather than hyper, excuse me, or, you know, exaggerating the effect. Yes, that's true. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it is hard to, uh, in these behavioral experiments that are really typical of the psychology literature, it is hard to say what they should technically be doing because in order to say what your estimate your answer should be, you have to know the diagnosticity of the individuating information. So you have to know the sensitivity and specificity of um, the individuating information in order to give a like correct answer, given the base rate. If you don't know how diagnostic that information is, because it's like, you know, some symptoms or some stereotypical description of an engineer or something like that, um, you don't know exactly what they should say but you do know that it should be higher when the base rate is higher. So that's sort of how those experiments work is we know that when we increase the base rate, the probability estimates should increase. And if they don't, something is terribly wrong, but we can't say exactly what those um, numbers should be. I've got a question. Um, when you did those tests for example, engineers versus lawyers, did you provide a description that was seemingly neither of them as a baseline for, you know, a 50-50 or something like that? Um, no, usually uh, in those experiments, the description suggests one or the other. Um, and it, it's not certain, um, but it's suggestive that one or the other is true. And that's intentional. That's... Um, because if you do that, then you know that, okay, they're going to think it's a lawyer or an engineer, but their exact estimate that they give you um, should only differ based on the base rate then. If it's completely non-diagnostic, like it, it seems like it could be a lawyer or an engineer equally, then um, normatively they shouldn't use that information at all and they should only use the base rate. So it's hard to evaluate sort of how they're um, integrating those two things together if it's a completely undiagnostic description. I, I think that's 
It's a good point, actually, though, because it is. It could almost be something along the lines of like a trust in information, because the individuals will pro presumably have a reasonable amount of trust in their ability to tie these characteristics to a particular individual. But if the characteristics, if the individual has no trust of their ability to link that to an individual, like this person is six foot tall and wears uh, glasses. It's like, it's like in that point, does the actual base rate come into it because they lack trust in their own ability to use their information? Or is there an effect of using someone who they trust information more from in terms of giving them the base rates? Will they use that information? Or like, I, I, don't, I don't know whether like the trust in the information actually plays into it, but it seems like an interesting... I, I know that I don't trust my own stereotypes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely plays into it. And there's um, huge individual variability in how diagnostic the information is perceived to be. Um, so in that case, if you don't trust your ability to use the information to make a decision, or you don't trust the information, in that case, you would only have the base rate to make your decision. So um, when information is relatively undiagnostic, we see uh, generally you see larger effects of, of the base rate. And if the information is super diagnostic, you see smaller effect of the base rate, which is normative. That's how Bayesian yeah. everything is, of course. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of individual variation. Um, so what these experiments do is they keep the um, individuating information the same um, in each condition. So in the small base rate condition and the large base rate condition, so that, um, even if the individuals vary in how diagnostic they find the information to be, all you need to know is the difference between those two conditions. Does that make sense? So could you repeat that? Sure. So what these experiments do is um, they, they manipulate the base rate without manipulating the individuating information, like the diagnostic yeah. information. So I give you like the same description of the person in one scenario and say there's uh, a base rate of 30 engineer, 30% 30 engineers. And then I give you the same information in another situation. But in this situation, I say this sample has 70% engineers. So even if you differ from the person next to you in how diagnostic you find that information to be, say you don't trust the information, but the person next to you does, or you know a lot of engineers, so it's easier for you to pick them out or something like that. Um, it doesn't matter because that's held consistent across conditions. So all you need to look at is, does their estimate change? So my estimate could be a 10% chance that he is uh, an engineer in one condition and 30% chance in the other condition. And yours could be like 70% and 100%, but it, it's okay. So our absolute values of our estimates will be different because we find that information um, differently diagnostic. Uh, however, um, it's, do we both go up when the base rate goes up? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I guess, is this assuming like in, in, the, in the complete absence of diagnostic information, they would resort to the base rate? Um, I mean, that's an empirical question because if people really do see base rates as irrelevant to problems like mm. has been suggested in some work like uh, the Giga Renzer work and stuff like that, where he did find that people didn't think it was relevant, um, then maybe they would just guess 50% 50, 50. each. Yeah, who knows? Um, but they should guess the, the base rate. And actually, I do have some data that speaks to that now that I think about it, because the catch trials that I included in some of these tasks, um, so like in behavioral tasks, like that's what we call trials where we just see if the pe people are paying attention. So they're the easy sort of obvious trials. And if they get those wrong, you know, they're not paying attention. Um, but in the catch trials, what, what, I would what, use... What would you say? Sorry. Catch trial? I was making a joke. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Um, I didn't pass that one. But <laughs> um, so the, the catch trials that I used were like situations where there wasn't a description of the person and there was just a base rate. So I would say like, 
oh, this researcher is doing a study with, on Huntington's and 50% of the people have Huntington's in their sample and 50% don't and they know this for certain because blah, 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 genetic testing, blah, blah, blah. And I'd say if they randomly pick a person from this sample, what's the probability that that person will have Huntington's? They'll always answer that correctly. Um, so it sort of speaks to it in a way, at least that they do pay attention to the base rate. Um, but yeah, it's hard to say. It's kind of an empirical question. If, if no one else has a question, could, I, could we double back? Um, uh, I can't remember the topic, uh, actually, but I remember that your answer was that it didn't work in the medical examples. Um, yeah. well, can, you, can you remember the topic? Because I was really excited and thinking it should be valuable. But, so what was yeah, it? That so was I. <laughs> Um, so do you want to know what the questions were, or what the result was? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what I want to know, actually. So I can just kind of summarize it for you if you want. So basically, we gave these experts and non-experts different problems where the base rate was the prevalence of the disease in the population that, that applied to that person. Um, and, Obviously, that's vague. I can go more into that if you want. But the individuating information was like symptoms and appearance and stuff like that. So we could say, um, you know, this the base rate of sleep apnea in this population is one um, percent, and this person uh, snores a lot and they wake up tired with headaches and sore throat and etc. All these things that are characteristic of sleep apnea patients. Um, so it's sort of like the prevalence of the disease is the, the base rate and the, the symptoms and stuff are like analogous to um, this person is charismatic and whatever that we said about lawyers. So that was kind of the, the stimuli. And then we used 1% base rates and 30% base rates and manipulated the sample size used to calculate the base rate. Um, and we described that in detail like this, um, this percentage is based on a meta-analysis of all published records of Alzheimer's or whatever. It's right? some elaborate description of why this is so accurate. Um, and it, we didn't find that it mattered what the sample size was. And it could, it could be what you said before, 100 is enough. 100 is decent. Um, but for one reason or another, we didn't find an effect there. Yeah. So um, if that's the case, then what do you think the prognosis for your success and your postdoc at Cornell will be? <laughs> because well, it's luckily it's not, luckily it's not exactly that what we're working on. So it's not sample size um, per se, it's model estimates. So obviously sample size has some influence over those. So how much data did you have to train this model? But um, there are other things. Yeah, there's other things that we can work on. So have you been making, so, so do you have a, a calculus for explaining uh, uncertain information to patients and or physicians now? Not or, really. I mean, just, we have things that we know are sort of better or worse than other things, but um, the hardest thing really is, we, you know, we have a million models to predict all sorts of things, but how to express uncertainty from a model estimate is, is so much harder than you would think to do that in an easy way to tell physicians and patients. It's very complicated. So we're still working on that. Yeah. Um, well, we'd certainly be interested in uh, working with you on that topic because that is a... Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I will take any ideas. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough topic and it's hard because it's, there's you know, there's so much at stake and you don't want to say something that misrepresents, you know, a model estimate or something like that. And somebody makes a life or death decision on it. So, right. I think one thing that I've, I've, I've taken to saying lately, mostly because I think it'll get a rise out of somebody, not because it's necessarily true, but the, the, the statement is that we should stop using graphical tools to explain these uh, outcomes. I think that verbal tools, be most efficient and, and maybe are preferable to you know, things like spinners or or or, or even uh christian's uh curtained 
uh, risk thermometers. Um, yeah. Those are clever, um, but they're they're going to be annoying to people. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the the verbal way is the way to go. At least that's my current hypothesis. So. Yeah. Yeah, it gets especially complicated when you have sort of layers, like, like of you know everybody who gets an LVAD, this, this artificial heart um, device, of everybody who gets this, you know, you could say ten percent have bleeding or something like that. I'm I'm making that number up, but you get the point. And then, but you don't just want to give that. You want to give this personalized estimate. So what does it mean? Do we say like is there a way that we can say 10% of patients like you or something or patients mm. who also fit into like these categories? And then how do you define like, like you, right? Um, like, do you use the most influential variables to categorize them? Obviously you don't want to categorize them on things that have no influence, but it, it's hard to, people can't deal with multiple probabilities, nested probabilities or like layered probabilities. They really struggle with that. So it's hard to find like a singular probability with some estimate of uncertainty that you can present people with. And is it true that you don't find a difference between the physicians and the patients that physicians are just as dumb as the patients they? Yeah, I'm, I've never been able to find a difference in anything that I've looked at. The only thing I found was that um, familiarity with the condition is more, um, has more of an effect with medical professionals. So medical professionals will say that something, a disease is more likely if they've seen it more, right? <laughs> right. Um, Just like, like me that. with an accident on the highway, right? Yeah. I pay for a driver after I've seen an accident. Yeah, I it's an availability heuristic, but that's the only difference I can find. Don't, don't you think that doctors are trained to ignore base rates so that they can assess the individual rather than look at populations. They say that. Yeah, I, I, I do think that. I definitely agree with that. I mean, they, yeah, they explicitly say that, you know, in their textbooks and in their training, you can find plenty of examples where they say, um, you know, to not think about other cases, to use your clinical intuition and treat every case as unique and, and things like that. Um, so I do think that they are trained to sort of think that it is some more intuitive or case specific um, decision, but I think it's, it's changing slowly, but there, there definitely is a sort of culture of that. I, mean, I say that, I say that because my brother's in, in med school and arguing with him about anything is, is, is impossible. And yeah. just to say. <laughs> Uh, we only look at the patient's symptoms and, and the record and their record and everything else can, can go in the trash. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's a reasonable point yeah. to make though, but yeah. But no. like, I'd, I'd say, cause we, we had like a little questionnaire out at a, a local hospital recently talking about risk communication uh, with anesthetists. And it struck me that, I don't know how reflective this is of just the general population's understanding of probability, but uh, and how I don't know whether it speaks more of my lack of faith in people's general probabilistic aptitude. But they were very aware that the probabilistic estimates that a an algorithm or a calculator spits out has nothing to do with the individual patient. It's it's a frequentist kind of or like it's supposed to be interpreted in a frequentist sort of over time this many people it has nothing to do with this one individual patient and i like i don't know how surprising i how surprised i should be that they were aware of that basic notion at least yeah I mean, we did, I, to be fair, we did find that in, in my um, study with the medical experts that they did use the base rates. It's not, they didn't completely ne neglect the base rates. So I shouldn't say that they completely neglect them. Um, but it's like when you, when they talk about how they make the decision, they won't account for it. But if you actually present them with something like, I do think most physicians would think like, schizophrenia or something is let would they would require more evidence for that mm. than anxiety or something i do i do think they use it 
but um, I should say it's, instead of that they don't use it, they don't think they use it or they don't think they need it or something like that. I mean, to be fair to them, they do get a very rarefied picture of the human community, right? I mean, the only people that come to doctors are the weird ones that have these weird symptoms. I mean, why are you here? You're already, you've already in a very different reference class than a random person selected from the street. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I went to the doctor and was diagnosed with Dutch Elm disease, uh, it never occurred to the doctor that Dutch Elm disease was very, very rare in humans because it's a disease of trees. <laughs> so a lot of base rate neglect there. <laughs> yeah, a lot. I was just like, I don't know, just throwing random ideas out. Could you present a sort of scale of like, given a the output of an algorithm that represents like an overall population level base rate, a scale of like, probabilities that have some sort of like Bayesian uh, almost like how plausible would it be to give this patient a 10% a risk of I don't know sneezing or something like if, if the population level rate is 2% you could have a sliding scale of it'd be very plausible to give this person 2% it would be extreme to give them 80% but perhaps you wouldn't be incredibly absurd to suggest that in your clinical opinion, you think it could be 10%. Almost just to try and act as like a, a gauge on, if they think it's very bad, but based on like Bayes' rule, it would be incredibly unlikely for it to, to be as bad as their fear suggests. Whether that might be an alternative way of representing the output of these kind of algorithms. To, it's to, like to try and build it towards being used in that clinical judgment method. So sort of based on the characteristics of that patient, you would move along that scale? Yeah. So like if, if you have someone who's a smoker, who drinks like, I don't know, three bottles of vodka a day, who's never exercised in their life, then it's like like then yeah you might say well i'd be more happy moving towards the extreme end of the scale yeah but yeah. like and and then that's ju it's only based on clinical judgment and but then the base rate affects the distribution of that scale yeah yeah i think something like that could be promising so it's sort of they can use their clinical intuition to move within a sort of pre-established like reasonable range based on the base rate or something like that mm. yeah yeah. I mean, like, I'm supposed to be uh, meeting with uh, the anesthetist from the hospital in a week next Tuesday, I think it is, uh, to discuss things like so. Like, I, I think I, I might present the notion of adjusting the way uh, algorithms provide this information in that format and see. I don't know, get some feedback from their end, like how they feel Yeah, that would, inter that would change their use. Yeah, that, that'd be an interesting topic. Um, I'd be happy to hear more about it if you do get some feedback from them. Yeah. yeah. We were also talking about a sort of a, a patient's or really a physician's bill of rights with respect to uh, these risk score uh, mm. or risk algorithms. Um, you know, for instance, I mean, the, and the reason, of course, is that there are so many of them and they're starting to be become important, not because they give the answers, but because they provide a context uh, that is becoming more and more familiar to physicians. And they say, well, this one's always, you know, conservative in this direction and this one's always that way. But so if they're both bad, that means something. Um, but it, because the these risk scores, these various algorithms are so, I mean, they're not medical devices, right? They're not regulated in the way that almost everything else in medicine is. There's no accountability really for these risks. Scores. What is the basic level of good design that they should meet? I mean, if you look at the calculations inside, do they, do the units match? I mean, are they, are they adding blood sugar to uh, heart rate? <laughs> what, are, what are they doing in there? And, and what 
transparency do we need to trust these algorithms? There's actually um, a group for this now. I can't remember what the full name is, but the acronym is um, IPDAS. Uh, it's like Institute for something decision aid something, but it's for medical decision aids. Um, and they have like a whole checklist of things that your your decision aid needs to include, like how things are calculated and I mean, not like really specific stuff about the models, but sort of what's calculated, I should say, and um, how you present it, like how your probabilities are, are presented and things like that. Um, I don't know how exactly how good they are. Like, I haven't looked into the reasons why they have all these requirements, but there is now a group that is supposed to do that. Oh, it's a group. Mm. It's yeah, a group a, of people. It's IF something DAS? I think it's IP DAS or something. Um, okay. Thank you. International Patient Decision Aid Standards. There we go. Yeah. Well, good. They will be our, our Lotus one, two, three. Uh, and yeah. we, will, we will be the Microsoft Excel. <laughs> I know that uh, in the security industry, they have two, there's two design approaches. One would be to produce a tool for experts to use data that they, that they collect as a decision making tool. For example, if you had a, uh, a map of, of a country and you had where the crimes are being committed, you would give them that map. And then the police officers would decide where to investigate, where to deploy more people. And then there's another approach from the other end, which has the computer deciding where to send officers. And that's the, uh, that's where, for example, I can't actually say what countries in specific, but other countries would want to just deploy depending on the computer and let that have have that tell them what to do versus the human making the decision. And I feel that that would be, you know, that these approaches were going to exist in medicine too. Yeah. Yeah, I think one example that came up with the, the doctors we were speaking to is the fact that um, there's one particular calculator that if it exceeds a certain threshold, then you you are expected at that point to go and get a consultant's opinion on the patient before proceeding with some sort of uh, procedure. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, so it's like, it's... Like, I don't know how hard the rule is, like whether or not it is actually a rule, but I know that if you decided not to do that, justifying that position would be quite difficult it would come up during the trial yeah yeah you would yeah. have to explain why you got a re you got a result of over the threshold and you didn't call a consultant why did you do this yeah so and then if if these calculators are being used like that then you very much should expect them to to have certain standards in terms of like legibility and interpretability and like yeah. how like, a like sample sizes and things, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you would hope so. Um, are there any other final questions for um, Kelly and or Christian? Uh, we're, we're coming up on two hours and we've abused them pretty severely. <laughs> uh, I, I, did have, I did have one for, for Christian, but I, I don't know if you can answer it, Kelly. I was just interested in terms of um, how the sort of loss function interacts with people's sense of ownership and whether or not the loss function is sort of affected by the fact that if you own something, there's less, I don't know, is, well, I, it's more a question. If you own something, is there less uncertainty in your perception of its value? Because you currently own it, whereas something you don't own, even yeah. if it's, even if it's a nebulous concept, like just monetary, some sort of, arbitrary currency yeah there's um there's an effect um, there's a name for this effect it's like a bias that people I know, yeah it's in it's one of the ones that kahneman tversky yeah it's one of yeah. those classic ones um but 
that finding was was sort of along those lines. I think I, maybe not necessarily that it's you're more certain about its value, but that you at least value it more or are are less willing to give it up or something like that. But um, yeah, I'm not really sure in the case of the loss of art and stuff Christian talked about. I think Scott, didn't you work on that? You're the other author on that, aren't you? Maybe you could answer better. I, w I wasn't paying attention. Uh, the, <laughs> the loss aversion paper, isn't that you and Christian's paper? Well, yeah, um, and Jack, but uh, we haven't worked on it since I left uh, New York. He hasn't yeah. been returning my phone calls. It's basically just how, how does an individual's sense of ownership change their loss function? And like, is, oh. is, is, the, is the loss function... Well, I'll tell you this, if, there's, if you have more, if you have less uncertainty about something because you own it and you know exactly what its features are, uh, that could reduce uh, the effect. Um, because we, it, it seems pretty clear that no matter how you slice it, it's the uncertainty that's causing the loss of aversion. Yeah, it's like if, if you have a current, like your current state whatever that might be, like whether it's own, the state is owning $50 or whatever, you don't have uncertainty about what it's like being in that state because you are currently in that state. So like, I just, I don't know, it, like, is the loss of aversion different in a case where, say you present someone, you can win, here's a thousand pounds and you'll play this game with this a thousand pounds and however much you're left with at the end, you'll win. Are they more or less loss of, like, do they treat that as if they currently own it? And is that different to giving them a thousand pounds initially just off the bat and asking them to play a certain number of rounds? And does that affect loss aversion? I feel, I feel confident that Christian would have a good answer for that question, but I don't. I would think the safe answer is probably yes, that it would have some effect. Yeah, it, it seems natural that it should. Yeah. I don't know, it'd, be, it'd be interesting trying to peel apart. Yeah, definitely. So the contribution Kelly, you, of the two factors. You displayed uh, several of those uh, attempts to explain those, you know, mostly icon arrays. Uh, pictures. Is there an assemblage of them somewhere that uh, you're working from, or are you just picking them up as you go along? Um, these I just picked up. There, there are a few websites that are sort of dedicated to these things. There's one called um, Viz Health, like visual, vizhealth.org uh, or something. And it's all about representing medical risks and stuff like that. Um, it's a huge literature on these things, like how to display these things. Um, the pictograms are everywhere. They love pictograms. Yeah. <laughs> and I've noticed that the advice is remarkably contradictory and not really supported by data very much. The, yeah. the, for instance, there's protestations about use of color that aren't, I mean, they just made that stuff up as far as I can tell. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's a lot of contradictory stuff. I'm sure there's, there's some good work and I'm, I'm working on digging through and trying to find some, um, you know, consistent recommendations, but there's a lot of really contradictory stuff. There's, a, there's, quite a few papers that show that pictograms are really bad, but everybody uses them. <laughs> right. So we, we would like to have a convention on what we can believe out of all this literature. I mean, I, I sort of totally believe Gig Renzer and, and Cosmides and Toby about percents. Mm -hmm. um, mm. and I totally believe them about, uh, you know, the, the, the experience the reference class being specific, that seems like it's obviously right. Yeah. But a lot of things are just kind of maybe wishful thinking at some point. It, it, is there a list? Has, has anybody had a convention? Maybe we should have a meeting or a conference just to find out what the things we really believe are. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of review papers on, on images and stuff like that for presenting probabilities. Um, I could dig them up if you're curious, but yeah, I mean, in, in my experience, like the, the, the type of work that I've been doing is basically the one consistent thing that I've learned is that like uncertainty about these risks needs to be presented for the best decision to be made. Um, yeah. In and some that, way, the best way to do it, I don't know, but. But that in itself is highly controversial. Yeah. Poisons reject that out of hand, so it's, it's worth noting. 
Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for your talk. I really, really enjoyed thank it. Thank you all for your Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And if anybody has any follow-up things, you can get my email from Scott or Simon or somebody. Um, I'd be happy to hear about a couple of you mentioned some ideas or following up with some physicians. I'd be happy to hear more. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know how the uh, chat with the physicians goes. Yeah. Simon will eventually ask you if he can have your slides. I, 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 and this recording will go up with your permission, uh, maybe within a couple of days. You can see. It. I, I apologize, I didn't get the first your introduction or the, probably the first slide, but I was quick after that. I oh, no, no worries. You're fine. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Kelly. Have a good one. Have a good day.